thank the team one more time. They just did a remarkable job. And <laughs> even from the sense of the, uh, the little rap that was done a few moments ago that was all written uh, by those guys as well and just uh, produced this for us this morning, I think you can give them a hand as well. They did a great job on that. So. <clears throat> Well, uh, as we walk into Christmas and walk into this morning, uh, certainly for me, as I was thinking about this, thinking about this week and this weekend, and I love Christmas. Um, how many of you love the food of Christmas? I think I gained like 10 pounds over the holidays, kind of crazy. Movies of Christmas, anybody love the movies of Christmas? I love the movies, Scrooge and all the other things go with it, traditions, the lights, the nativities. We have a nativity that we put out at our house uh, every, uh, those things are glued to that thing. <laughs> Can't steal Jesus on this one, can you? And, uh, but we love putting our nativity out and having that as well and uh, certainly a lot of, lot of uh, things that center around that. And, but one of the things I really do love is I love the, I love the songs of Christmas and, and just what the songs mean to so many of us. And, uh, and I, I love the songs we've been singing this morning already and they've been great. One of the songs that I really, really like is the song, Oh Holy Night. And I don't know if you know anything about that song, but uh, there's a lot of great history to Oh Holy Night. Uh, back in, uh, actually, 1847, there was a little Catholic church in a little town in France that had a brand new organ. And when a church gets a new organ, you've got to dedicate that organ. And, uh, and so it was, they were going to dedicate it on Christmas Eve services, and so the local priest contacted a, uh, a man that was actually kind of a curator of wines in that little community. Uh, his name was Placide Capou, Capo, and uh, Capo was actually an atheist, and yet he was a, he was a great poet. And, uh, and so the, the priest contacted Placide and said, could you create a, a song uh, so we could use that to dedicate our new organ? And so uh, he said he would. So he actually went to Luke 2, and he read through Luke 2, and he came up with what he called the Cantique de Noel. And uh, then he thought, well, it needs some music attached to it. So he had a, a friend who was a Jewish composer by the name of Adolf Adams, and uh, he went to Adolf and he said, could you complete, could you compose a, a melody around it? So he did exactly that. And three weeks later, that song was sung at, Christ, at Christmas Mass in that little town. And, uh, and so then, then as it went on, uh, these two men became socialists and the church banned the song from being sung uh, in all of France and as it continued to make, make its way throughout the world. And then it was about a century later, an abolitionist by the name of, of uh, John Sullivan Dwight heard the song and uh, brought it over from, from France over to America. And the one line that he loved the most was this line that says, truly taught us to love one another. His, love is, his law is love and his gospel is peace. Change shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. And he thought that's the song for America right now. And uh, then it was in 1906, um, there was Reginald Fessenden and uh, he was a guy that uh, actually worked for uh, Edison, actually a lot later than 06. And uh, he's chief chemist, and there was a new type of generator that was, had just been developed. And uh, that generator could actually kind of begin to speak voices over the airways. And so for the first time that anybody ever heard a voice over the airways, uh, Reginald read from Luke 2, and then it was done. He grabbed his violin, and he played O Holy Night on his violin. And so a little history behind O Holy Night. Great song. O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining that he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. When you think about Christmas, Christmas reminds us so much of the goodness of God, the graciousness of God, the, the power of God, the desire of God, the passion of God, the pursuit of God, the love of God. But you cannot go through Christmas without really spending some time thinking about the holiness of God. So what comes to our mind, as Tozer said once, that what comes to our minds when we think about God is, is really the most important thing about it. And when you think about God, you have to begin to ask yourself a series of questions. That is that, is my God great or small? Is my God almighty and simply strong? Is my God harsh or is he kind? Is my God safe or is he threatening? Is my God in the distance or is he up close? Is my, con is my God concerned about me or does he even care for me? And Christmas, what it does is it brings all those questions into play this morning. And you begin to understand that at Christmas, Emmanuel, God with us, that God really does care for us. And a lot of times we get caught up in the simplicity of Christmas and we lose sight of the holiness of Christmas, that holy night. The night was not holy, but what happened that night was very holy. What happened that night was a holy God coming to this earth to take on, uh, to take on uh, the role of, 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 of Jesus. Jesus, not the role, but Jesus comes to this earth 
Emmanuel, God with us, to go all the way to the cross for your sins and for my sins. So when I was thinking about this issue of holiness and helping us get our, our kind of our heart around it, the one passage I went to, and it's not a Christmas passage, but it's out of Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, when we really see the holiness of God really kind of coming at us in full bloom. This is what happens in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah gets a glimpse of the holiness of God. And just kind of stay with me for a few moments. It said that in the year that King Uzziah died, he had reigned for 50-some years, he said, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the throne of his robe filled the temple, and above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And the whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And Isaiah says, woe to me. Uh, uh, he says, woe to me. He said, I am ruined. For a man of unclean lips, I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the, the Lord, the King of glory. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, and with it he'd taken the tongs from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away and your sin atoned for. Now, what does that passage have anything to do with Christmas? <laughs> it has a lot to do with Christmas. So just stay with me. One thing we see in this passage is this. We see that God's holiness reveals God's greatness is what it does. That in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. Now, don't forget this. Isaiah is in the temple seeking guidance, and he has one of those up-close and personal encounters with God. He says, I saw the Lord. And he's not referring not to God's name, but to his position. He's saying, I saw the sovereign, I saw the majestic one, I saw the creator, the king, and the ruler of everything. And he sees him seated, so don't miss this. God is seated, he's settled, he's in control, he's fully aware of what's going on in this world. He's not in a hurry, he's confident, he's sovereign, he's in charge, not anxious about a thing, not pacing around wondering what is gonna happen next. He's not clueless or distant, but fully aware of everything you're walking through in an up close and personal way. He knew the government was going to shut down before the government shut down, you know? And uh, now just think with me for just a moment about your greatest worry that you may be faced with right now. Maybe your greatest anxiety. You, you might be pacing, you might be wringing your hands, you might be wondering how the situation is ever going to work itself out. And yet, God is sitting. He's sitting, He's in charge. The world may appear to be out of control, but God is not. Your world may appear to be out of control, but God is not. Isaiah's world appeared to be a little bit out of control, but God was not. And it says he's exalted. And Isaiah's taken back. He acknowledges the majesty of his God, the greatness of God. And the truth is, is that many times we, we give all sorts of thoughts to God. We call God the big man upstairs. We look to him as, as, uh, as, someone, or some, as someone that's way out there in the distance, or we make him so personal that he begins to seem like you and like me. Weak and inadequate, ineffective, unpredictable, forgetful, unsure, unclear, limited in power. Matter of fact, J.I. Packer, he made the statement, he said, our personal life is a finite thing. It is limited in every direction, space and time and knowledge and power, but God is not limited. He is eternal, infinite, and almighty. He has us in his hands. We never have him in ours. Like us, he is personal, but unlike us, he is great. Amen. Then Isaiah, when he sees God in the midst of this glory, he says, when he sees the Lord, he says, and the train or the hymn filled the temple. When you think about that, I, I couldn't help but not think of a bridal gown in the midst of that. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Nick Jonas got married to Priyanka. <laughs> This was, her, this was her dress. And kids, I just want to tell you right now. Girls, I just want to tell you right now. If you ever think that your dad's going to buy you a dress like that, he's not. Because there's no guy in this room that can afford to buy a dress like that. But if you can, I'd love to have lunch with you and just talk to you for a few moments. Because I'd like to be your friend. But, you know, Isaiah is consumed with the hem of his robe. And he says it fills the temple and going back and forth and up and down and front and back. And he's awestruck with its splendor. Now, don't miss this. Because if the hem of God's robe fills the temple, then think about his presence. Later in Isaiah, uh, he, will walk, he will walk us in the presence of an all-consuming God, which he will say is Emmanuel, God with us. He will help us to see God as a wonderful counselor and a mighty God, an everlasting father and a prince of peace. Now dwell for a moment on his presence in your life in this place right now on this Christmas weekend. In your current situations and your circumstances, he is all there. His presence is not void of your life. You know, maybe this Christmas, you're in a season of aloneness. Maybe you're walking through a time of suffering or loss or, or struggle or frustration or fear or worry or anxiety or an uncertainty. I mean, this is it's kind of where I'm at in so many ways. But what you believe about God truly does impact 
how you'll walk through the season with God as well. And one of the books that I just recently picked up, and I, I picked it up because of its title. It's written by Paul David Tripp, my favorite author. It's a book called Suffering. And, uh, and you might look at that book and think, what do I need that book for? Well, we all need a, a good theology of suffering. And he talks about this issue of God's presence, and it really struck me when I, when I thought about this. He says, God is faithful to us, not because we are righteous, but because he is. He continues to love us, not because we perfectly love him, but because his love for us remains perfect. He remains near, not because we never thought of running away, but because he would never turn his back on his promises he made to us. You didn't earn his faithful presence by your obedience, and your disobedience won't take it away. The central message of Scripture is that God is with us forever because of the one thing and the one thing alone, his grace. In your suffering with so many things to worry about, you don't have to waste your spiritual and emotional energy on the fear that you will be forsaken by the one who has the power to do for you what no one else can. He is in you. He is with you. He is for you. And he will never leave you. God is, is with us. The Lord is with us. And then, and then Isaiah sees these angels flying around. He calls them seraphs, and they have six wings, and two wings they cover their faces, and they're covered, they cover their feet with the other two, and two they're flying with at the same time. It's amazing, and, and it's a busy place. And really, when you think about these angels, what it means is seraphim means burning one. So these are not the kind of angels you see in, in, a, in a wonderful life. You see that little frumpy angel that comes to in a wonderful life. That's not what this gives, gives you the image of at this point. These, the, 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 these are living flames of pure praise, sinless yet humble before God. And they speak these words, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. In the Hebrew culture, if you really wanted to emphasize something, you would repeat it. The angels could have said, love, love, love. They could have said grace, 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 mercy, 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 forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. But they say holy, holy, holy. And nowhere else in scripture will you find a three-peat to speak of one of God's attributes. God is holy and his holiness, in his holiness, all things are tied together. Don't miss this on this Christmas season. Because he's holy, his love is holy, pure. His mercy is holy mercy. His grace is holy grace, always extended. His justice is always fair because it's not based on reasonable doubt, but on beyond a shadow of a doubt, and it's holy justice. And his holiness, more than anything else, is that makes him worthy of our praise. Holy means set apart. It also means this. It means other than. Only a holy God can make things other than what they are right now. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever asked that question or kind of dwelled on that for a minute? And you, you think, man, I wish I could just, if it was just other than this right now, if my marriage was just other than this right now, if my loneliness could only be met with something other than this right now, if only my relationships were focused on other than this right now, if my life just had a little bit of other than, if just other than this, well, with a holy God, with a holy God, it can be other than what it is right now. I love how, uh, how this uh, little song, O Holy Night, talks about this issue of, of O Holy Night. It talks about how long lay the world in sin and error pining. It's what, it's what Isaiah was facing at that point. There was a longing. There was a waiting. That little line, it paints a serious and tragic picture of our world literally wallowing in our need, a need that only God can meet. Second thing that we know about God is this, and that is that, that the holiness of God shows us who we are. Isaiah sees God in all of his glory, and he just has three words to say. <laughs> woe is me. Can you say that with me? Woe is me. Yeah, woe is me. It's the first words Isaiah is going to speak in his book. And here's a prophet pronouncing a prophetic woe on himself, because when we see God, we also see ourselves. And he's confronted with his sinfulness, and all he can say is woe, is just woe. So you cannot stand in the presence of a holy God very long before he exposes your sin, not the sin of someone else, but your sin. About 11 years ago, we got this little puppy for Christmas. We, we bought this little puppy, and we gave it to her, put it in a box. We wrapped it up with paper. Not for very long, though. And, uh, 
brought the kids downstairs. They unwrapped the box, and out came this beautiful little snoodle, part schnauzer, part poodle, and, and uh, she's about 15 pounds, and she's very smart. She's very obedient, and, and she always knows when she does something wrong, and I came in the other night. The kids and I had been out. I came in. I walked in the door, and I looked. I saw this black flash across the kitchen floor, and I realized she had gotten into the garbage. I didn't, don't ever leave the garbage out, but I did then, and she got in the garbage, and I looked over, and she ate a couple donuts, and I don't know what else she ate at that point, but, but she, she ran immediately. She knew she was in trouble. I walked in. It's kind of like seeing the holiness of God in that moment. Your sin is fully exposed before you, and, you know, she went running. Cats would never do that. Cats would just come to lay down and say, yeah, look what I did, you know, because, you know, they're part of the fall, but... Uh, but dogs are not, you know, and so, so she runs and, you know, and she gets in her cage and whatever else, does her thing, and then the next day, she's out. She's, like, lethargic and sick and laying there, body shaking the whole time. If you wouldn't have gotten the garbage. I'm not going to tell you how much that dog cost me this week. <laughs> A veterinarian appointment, uh, you know, uh, some x-rays. Yeah, she's got a couple staples in there, but they'll come out. I'm thinking... You cost me a lot. But she immediately knew what she did wrong. Well, it's what Isaiah feels, feels at that point. Then you go back to that song, O Holy Night, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth, it says. Your soul knows when something's wrong, but yet the soul felt its worth. I love that line, because your soul is of such great worth to God, so much so that he sent Christ to us. As one person said it so well, your soul is worth so much that the transcendent God became imminent and dwelt among us. Jesus reminds us that every soul is worth something to God. See, God's plan is not to ruin us, but to redeem, reconcile, and rescue us from the sin that serves to ruin us. Third is that God's holiness confronts us with what we need. Because what happens here is this, that when one of the seraphs flew to me, Isaiah says, with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth, and he said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Now, why did the, why did the angel get the coal? Was it because he felt sorry for Isaiah? He hears Isaiah's woes, so he goes over, and he grabs a piece of coal and places it on his lips? No. The angel goes because God commands it. So don't miss this. You see a holy God, and now you see holy love, mercy, and grace in action. Because from the altar where a substitute for sin was offered, and it was on that altar that Isaiah's guilt and sin was atoned for. Now go 2,000 years. Back 2,000 years. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, comes in the form of a babe, grows, comes certainly grows and goes to the point of saying, you know what, I'm going to go to the cross to pay the penalty for those sins. First John 4, 10 says, this is love. We looked at this a few weeks ago. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his, ton as, his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In other words, because of what Christ did for you, we don't have to hide from a holy God, but we can embrace, we can be embraced by his holy love and his holy grace and then be set free to be transformed by the power of his holiness being worked out in our lives. And something happens as a result of that. It goes back to the little song, O Holy Night, a thrill of hope and the world, weary world rejoices. Jesus came for a weary world. Unforeseen trouble is weariness. Uncontrollable circumstances is weariness. Self-imposed pain becomes this issue of weariness. And yet that's why Christ came. Then the last is this. And then what we know about the holiness of God is that the holiness of God transforms us into what we can be. I love what Isaiah says. He said, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. I've been changed. In other words, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn in a holy night. Many of us are, are walking. We're walking into this season. Let me just say this to you in closing. We're walking into this season with a hold of sin in our life. And it might be holding you down from keeping you from experiencing the fullness and the freedom of God's grace. But if you have experienced the forgiveness of sins through the acceptance of Christ your Savior, you've been set free. Paul even tells us. He says that we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone the new has come. And what we have in the reminder this Christmas is that a holy God liberates us, liberates us by his grace, and it awakens us and unleashes us
to be his voices to another generation. So the concluding thought for Christmas this morning is this, that God in his holiness humbled himself to do what only he could do for you. There's another passage. It's a, probably my favorite Christmas passage. It's found in Philippians chapter 2. And this is, what is, this is what's described to us and what's told about what Christ did for us. It says that in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, and he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. What does Paul tell us there in Philippians? It tells us that God got small. It tells us that he came as God with us. They took on the very nature of a servant. It tells us so that he came as God with us so he could die as God for us, to became obedient to death, even death of the cross, to pay that penalty for your sins and for my sins so that we could live as God in us. God leading and guiding our lives as only a holy God can do. As one writer put it so well, like a king who out of love removed his crown, set aside his scepter, took off his royal robes, donned the ferment of a common beggar and lived among the poorest of his subjects, never ceasing to be king, he got low, so low, that he willingly died the death of a despised criminal, all to save his own. So this Christmas, where are you at with a holy God? A holy God who became small, who came down to this earth, Emmanuel, God with us, not simply to lie in a manger, but to go all the way to a cross to pay the penalty for your sins and for my sins. Because this Christmas, Jesus says, I'm with you. I paid the penalty for your sins to save you. And I long now to lead you in a very weary world. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, so grateful for uh, just the truth that Isaiah brings to us of being encountered by, by you in all your holiness. I know that for me, there are those moments in my life when I minimize that. There are moments when I am in brought, and when, I, when I'm, I'm, I come to a place of acknowledging and realizing that God, you are holy, and, and I cannot, cannot even begin to, to, to be even in the, the sense of your presence because of my sinfulness, but yet because of Jesus Christ and what you did, your presence has become real to me. Your forgiveness has become real to me. Your work that you did on that cross has become real to me. And that because of that, no matter what sin is done, no matter what weariness I walk into and I walk through, that Lord, I can give that to you. I can invite you into my life knowing that you came to be with us, to lead us and guide us through the work that you did for us on that cross some 2,000 years ago. So Lord, I pray this morning that if there's anyone in this room today that they've never come to the place of acknowledging you as your Savior, that through this weekend as we think about how holy you are, we recognize how much we need a holy God to lead our lives and to guide our lives as only you can do. We love you. In the name of Jesus, I pray.